And we now begin our study of functions. So a function f from a set A to a set B is a relation with domain A and codomain B that satisfies the following two properties. One, for every element x and A, there is an element y and B such that x, y is an f. So that is, every element in the domain gets mapped to something in the codomain. And two, for all elements x and y, and y, z, and b, if x comma y is an f, and x comma z is an f, then y is equal to z. That is, every element in the domain gets mapped to a unique element in the codomain. So, if we let f from a to b be a function, then any element in any element x and a, property one guarantees that there is at least one element of b that is related to x by f, and property two guarantees that there is at most one such element. So this makes it possible to give that element a special name. So if a and b are sets as a function from a to b, then given any element x and a, the unique element in b that is related to x by f is denoted this, which is read f of x. So we let a be the set 2, 4, 6. We let b be the set 1, 3, 5. We have three relations down here. And we're asked to determine which of them are functions. All right, so the easiest way to do this is to use an arrow diagram. So for R, so we're going to have this as our set A. Let's have this as our set B. So A has the elements 2, 4, and 6, B has the elements 1, 3, and 5. So, according to the relation up here, right, we have 2 gets mapped to 5. Four gets mapped to 1. 4 gets mapped to 3. And six gets mapped to five. Now this is not a function. Right? Because look, four gets mapped to one and to three. So four is not being mapped to a unique element. All right, so what if we look now at S? All right, so we let that represent set A, we'll let that represent the set B. All right, so two, four, six. So, y is equal to x plus 1. So, 2 will go to 3, 4 will go to 5, and 6 would go to 7, but 7 is not in b. So, 6 goes to nothing. So, this is not a function. Because 6 is unmapped. It doesn't get mapped to anything. And finally, let's consider T. So again, let's say that is A, that is B. So 
So 2 will go to 5. 4 goes to 1. And 6 goes to 1. Now this is a function. If we look, every element of A is getting mapped to something. And specifically that something is unique. Now, this is not a violation. Two elements going to the same output is not a violation of property 2. And also, nothing being mapped to 3 is not a violation of property 1. Alright, so now let's look at some properties of functions. If f from x to y and g from x to y are both functions, then f is equal to g if and only if f of x is equal to g of x for every x in x. So suppose that f from x to y and g from x to y are functions then f and g would both be subsets of x cross y, like the Cartesian product between x and y. For x, y to be an f means that y is the unique element that's related to x by f, which we shall denote f of x. Likewise, for x, y to be in g means that y is the unique element related to x by g, which we shall, which we shall denote as this, g of x. Now, let's suppose that f of x is equal to g of x for every x in x. Then, if x is in x, then x, y is in f, if and only if y is equal to f of x. But this is true if and only if y is equal to g of x, right? Because f of x and g of x are the same. But this is true if and only if x, y is in g. So, x, y is in f, if and only if x, y is in g as well. This means that f and g consist of exactly the same elements, and hence, f is equal to g. Conversely, suppose that f is equal to g. Then, for every x in x, y equals f of x, if and only if x, y is in f, but this is if and only if x, y is in g, because f and g are the same. This is true if and only if y is equal to g of x. So, f of x and g of x is equal to y, and so f of x must be equal to g of x. And so the proof is good. So, we let z sub 3 be the set of integers mod 3, so it's the set 0, 1, 2. Define the function f from integers mod 3 to integers mod 3, and g from integers mod 3 to integers mod 3 as follows. For all x in the integer mod 3, f of x is equal to x squared plus x plus 1 mod 3, and g of x is equal to x plus 2 quantity squared mod 3. So the question is, does f equal g? Now, remember, f of x and g of x would have to be the same for every single x in our set. So our set is the integers mod 3, so we only have to work with 0, 1, and 2. So we'll calculate x squared plus x plus 1. And then use this to calculate f of x, because right, f of x is just that, mod 3. Then we'll take a look at x plus 2 quantity squared, and take that, mod 3, to find g of x. So if x is 0, then x squared plus x plus 1 is just 1, and mod 3 is simply 1 x plus 2 quantity squared would become 4, which mod 3 is 1. 
we plug in 1, we get 3, which mod 3 is 0. Here we get 3 squared, which is 9, which mod 3 is 0. 2, we'll get 4 plus 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7, mod 3 is just 1. Here we get 4 squared is 16, which mod 3 is just 1. So if we look, it's these values we're concerned with. They are all the same. And so we can therefore conclude that f is equal to g. Now, suppose that we say, define a function, f, from the real numbers to the real numbers, by specifying that for each real number x, f of x is the real number y, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Now, there are two reasons why this does not describe a function for all values of x. Either there is no y that satisfies the given equation, right? So, for example, if we say x is 3, so this will be 9, so you would have to subtract 10, I'm sorry, you'd have to subtract 8 to get that 1. However, there is no real number that when you square it is negative 8. Or, there are two different values of y that satisfy the equation. Let x be equal to 0. Well, then you just need y squared to be 1 to get that 1. Well, 1 squared is 1, but negative 1 squared is also 1. So we have two values of y that would satisfy this relation. So we say that a function, and I'm using that term very lightly here, is not well defined if it fails to satisfy at least one of the requirements for being a function. Now the reason that I'm using quotes here is because it's not technically a function. Right? If it fails to satisfy even one of the properties, it's not even a function. So it doesn't make sense to say, well, this function is undefined, because it's not a function. So let's suppose you read that a function f from the rationals to the integers is to be defined by the formula f of m over n is equal to m for all integers m and n, with n not being zero. Is f well defined? Well, let's consider. One half and ten twentieths. Right. So clearly, one half is equal to ten over twenty. However, f of a half is equal to one, and f of ten twentieths is equal to. Well, last time I checked, 1 is not equal to 10. So, 1 half is mapped to two different values. So, 1 half is mapped to 1 and to 10. This violates the second property. Hence, f is not well defined. So, not only can functions act on a single element, they can actually act on whole sets. So let x, y, a, and c all be sets. If f from x to y is a function, 
and a is a subset of x, and c is a subset of y, then f of a is the set of all elements in y, such that y is equal to f of x for some x in a. And f inverse of c is equal to the set of all x in x, such that f of x is an element of c. Now, f of a is called the image of, of a. And f inverse of c is called the inverse image of c. Right, so let x be the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Let y be the set a, b, c, d, e. We define a function from x to y as this here. Now let a be the set 1, 4. Let c be the set ad. And let d be the set ce. We wish to find f of a, f of x, f inverse of c, and f inverse of d. So f of a. Right, so we're looking for the set of all elements such that y is equal to f of x for some x in a. Right, so we want the set of all elements in y such that f of x is equal to it for some x. Alright, so a is 1, 4. So f of 1 is b. f of 4 is also b. So f of a is just b. So f of x. So f of 1 is b. f of 2 is a. f of 3 is d. And f of 4 is b. Now if we look at f inverse of c, right, this is, we're looking for the set of all elements in f such that f of x is in, in this case, c. Right, so f of what is equal to a? Well, that's 2, right? And then f of what? is equal to d, well that would be 3. And now if we look for f inverse of d, so f of what is c, well there is nothing, f of what is e, well there is nothing, so, this is just the answer to that. Right, so now proposition. Let x and y be sets. Let f map x to y be a function. And let a, b be subsets of x. Then f of a union b is equal to f of a union with f of b. So, Suppose that we have sets x, y, a, and b, such that a and b are subsets of x. Also, let f, which maps x to y, be a function. Suppose that y is in f of a union b. Then, for some x in a union b, y would have to equal f of x. However, since x is in a union b, then x would be in a, or it would be in b. Suppose first that x is in a. Then y would have to equal f of x for some x in a, which means that y is in f of a, which means that y is in f of a union with f of b. Now suppose that x is in b. Then y would equal f of x for some x in b, which would mean that y is in f of b, 
This would mean that y would be an f of a union with f of b. Thus, f of a un I'm sorry, f of a union b is a subset of f of a union with f of b. And it will be left as an exercise to show that f of a union with f of b is a subset of f of a union b. This would prove that they are equal, and so the proof would be complete. So that concludes our first look at functions. We will then continue functions in the next video.